we've been riding around in a car together all afternoon. <laughs> um, but I, I want to start off with a question about um, dreams. And I guess, um, I mean, I guess I'm struck by two things. I mean, it's not simply like a documentary of you recording, you know, a range of thinkers about what the meaning of blackness is, as much as it is you curating and trying to, I guess, assemble, um, as I'm reading it, a certain set of propositions around blackness. And those propositions are actually very, very different. So I want you to kind of say more about the statement that's created through this various set of propositions on the one hand. And then the second part of the question is, in making this you were also involved in a kind of uh, critical practice um, and a critical practice that was challenging the centrality of the white gaze and the cinematic apparatus and actually trying to, um, to grasp, to illuminate, to record other expressive modalities. And I, I want you to talk about the relationship between <laughs> those other expressive modalities and the kinds of things that can be said and imagined about blackness. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> it off my head. Um, well, I guess maybe I'll just start a little bit talking about pro the process, because I think the process is bound up uh, well, the context in which the project came into being was um, uh, an associate of mine, Khalil Joseph, was approached uh, by Asa Mater, who was one of the producers on the project. About um, he had been asked, Asa, who was an American, was based in Paris, had been asked to do a uh, documentary on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Uh, they had two nights of programming done, and uh, uh, it was like killer, I think killer sheep, do the right thing. There were quite a few things, but they had this slot for this, uh, you know, what was going to be a look back at the March on Washington. And then they, they asked, they approached Khalil, and I think Khalil was, I don't know, he wasn't that interested, or, I don't know, you know, even thinking back, I think someone was generational, maybe, or something, but um, he kind of handed it off to me. And I was, I just looked at it, and I was like, hmm, I don't think I want to do this either. I was like, and I actually ended up talking to Ace, and, and I, I, I think I said to him something like, well, I'm really not interested in doing anything about the March on Washington, looking back at it. And I was like, plus I actually think I've seen that on PBS happening. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that film you know, maybe twice, two or three times. Um, and then he said, well, what would you want to do? And uh, my immediate response was just, yeah, I'm just interested in doing something about what black people are at now. It was like pretty straightforward. And um, and he said, well, what would that be? And then that's when it sort of, you know, it opened up into this more sort of complicated kind of space. Uh, the way I framed it for uh, ZDF, the Germans, was that uh, I said, I want to do something that looks, that's about the afterlife of the march in Washington. Because at the time in particular, I mean, we were sort of in the middle of what, you know, some people were saying was a golden age. We had a black president and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, well, in my circle, it don't seem like no golden age. And I was like, nobody seems happy, you know? I was like, nobody's really seeming too happy. So, I, you know, at a certain point, I just, you know, I think there's two types of work I know I'm really preoccupied with. I mean, I've come to understand them, you know, conceptually frame in a certain kind of way. Uh, one work is what I call Doro work. <laughs> and Doro is like, you know, and Octavia Butler. It's just like, and if anybody knows Octavia Butler, this character she wrote, Doro, is the most intense character she ever wrote. He's basically like a black spirit who's obsessed with like a kind of his ongoing eugenics program or something. He's trying to, he's uh, forcefully breeding interbreeding black people to try to create this body for himself. So when I say door works, I'm meaning basically I'm very preoccupied with the whole idea of bringing things together to create new things, whether those things are consensual or not. So that's one, one thing. But the other thing that I'm really preoccupied is what I call is usher work. 
And Usher work is work that's really <coughs> preoccupied with creating platforms uh, for, uh, for other things, or other people, you know, to sort of speak. And so I think this project was definitely one that I thought of in those terms, like when I, when I said, oh, we're black and black, where the question comes like, you know, how do you, how do you render that? How do you render this whole notion of where black people are at? I mean, is it simply what black people say, or where they say they're at, or is there another way that you can actually effectively sort of signify, or as I say, render where they're at? And, um, and this sort of goes to the second question. I'm gonna loop, try to loop back through the two of them. Is, um, and the one thing that I thought about a lot, like as a model too, in, in addition to this like tension between your work and usher work, was that um, there's this book that had a big impact on me, uh, Dry Long So by John uh, Gwaltney. Really incredible book. Uh, it's uh, Dry Long So, a portrait of uh, Afro-America, or Black America, maybe. So. And it's essentially a series of, um, of uh, interviews he did with people, testimonials. And it's just, it's just super striking. It's like super striking. I've read a lot of books, you know, testimonials and stuff, but there's something really, really particular about this thing in terms of the quality of um, frankness, I would say. Um, it's like one of the most beautiful and kind of truest written documents I've ever seen of how black people actually sound when they're thinking. Um, and, uh, but I was always struck in the introduction by something that he said. He said that he felt like one of the real reasons that he was able to elicit from people the, the type of testimonies that he did, he thought it was inextricably bound up with the fact that he was blind, that he couldn't see. And I, I mean, I literally thought about this for 20, 30 years, like this whole idea of the testimonial and um, being blind, the blind interviewer. And over the years, I sort of evolved this notion. I don't even know if it's a theory so much, it's like a notion kind of, this notion that if you point a camera at black people, uh, it triggers a series of what are essentially survival modalities that really have to do with being masked in a way, like what kinds of things you can say. Like in other words, the camera ends up being an instrument that's streaming the white gaze. It's like the camera ends up functioning as a sort of on a psychoanalytical level as a stand in for the white gaze. And whenever black people are subjected to the white gaze, there's this whole series of really protective and survival things in terms of what you can and cannot say. So the question was like, how do you get around that? So I thought John Gwaltney's observation was completely bound up in that. It's something about not being seen, freeing black people up to speak um, freely. So one of the first things that I decided in this project was that I was never going to point a camera at people when I talked to them. And that actually allowed, I think, for a lot of the nature of the um, sort of testimonials that people gave. But it also presented some very interesting formal problematics, problems of formal um, uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, you know, it's funny, like Greg, Greg Tate, friend, he said, he, he's, he's pointed out a couple of times, he said oftentimes when he's seen a film with an audience, he would ask them what they thought about the fact that there are no talking heads in it. There are a lot of heads, but they're not talking. <laughs> Um, and he said, people would say, what are you talking about? That people would actually experience it as if people were actually speaking. In fact, even though you never see anybody's lips speaking in sync, you know. Um, and so for me, like that, like I said, it's, it's something about this disjunction of the sound. Like to me, it's something about just hearing the voices as being like a, a kind of collective sub-vocal articulation, the way they flow around and stuff. On one hand, it's just foregrounding black people's subjectivity to me. It's, that's what I think. I think it's really making, it's creating an effect whereby you get the sense that you're actually are cutting to the, to the bone of the matter, right? Now, procedurally, the, and you know this too from being, in, you, know, in the, you know, participating in the project, like people were asking me, like interview people, I was like, well, I, I, don't, I don't think I interviewed anybody actually, in fact, my sort of strategy, so to speak, was to, like I said, turn the camera away, off, you know, out of the way, 
set up the recording thing and just started talking to people. And I would basically kind of say, this should be a goal, this is supposed to be a golden age, but we don't seem happy, what do you think? And most people would talk hours, in a couple instances, two or three hours. Most people would take them about an hour to talk to themselves out, um, tell me what they think. And you know, we smart, so we think some really interesting shit, right? So I'd just be listening. Mm -hmm. And it was an exercise in discipline, too, because I know everybody knows me, knows I'm a big blabber, so I had to be very disciplined and keep my mouth shut, right? So look, you know, in, in this sense, anybody who's been in therapy knows, it, knows the drill. You know, you sit there, you don't say anything, and it creates a kind of horror vacuum where people feel compelled to fill that empty space. So, Generally, me and one other person as a kind of, it seemed to work better if there was a kind of triangulation that was happening, meaning not just the person who was speaking, but me and somebody else. It seemed to work better. Um, people would just talk, tell me what they think, you know. I'd say it very, very, very little. And then when people had kind of told me what they thought, I generally would take a moment and I would say, okay, now you told me what you thought. Take a second now and tell me what you know. And most people would stop them. Some people say, like, what do you mean? What's the difference between the two? Or some people would just stop and think about it. And I would like, most people took a few minutes before they reoriented themselves. But a few people, like, they would just walk away. I know Hortense, like, she walked away for like 20, 30 minutes and came back and started up again. And so it's a strategy on one hand to sort of joke people out of that. Like, some, when people would ask me, if they asked me, like, what's the difference between what you think and what you know, I would say always, well, thinking to me is always in process. Because you can think something one day and think something totally different the next day, right? But all thinking is on the way to becoming something you either know to be true or you know not to be true. Once you know it, it's like it goes into this other place. It's not to say that it can't, you know, as we know in life, there's something you can know and you can find out that you really didn't know it. You thought you knew it, but it wasn't the case. But I think it just set up this kind of structure that would allow people to return to, in some ways, many of the things that they had said, and, um, but from a different vantage. So a lot of the rhetorical framework of the film was built specifically around people saying what they think versus what they know. So when Fred is going back and forth, well, I know this, but what I think is this, and I think this, but what I really know is this, or Hortense, who tells us all these incredible things that she thinks, and in the end, she comes back, but what I know is I'm gonna lose everybody, you know? And like in a sense, I think because they're just super, super loose, but at the same time very specific stratagem, what I think it kind of did was, and this is in hindsight now, this is not, you know, this is me just having thought about it from four years ago. I think it kind of corralled people into a way so that it stacked the folks that I talked to, it stacked people's experiences that certain thematics started to present themselves over and over. I'm going to ask the second okay. question. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, and, that's a, and it's precisely about this thing about what it is we know. And um, I think uh, in the film, something comes up that's very powerful. I mean, Hortense opens talking about you know this incredible gift of black culture. Um, but when we get to what we know, I was thinking about um, what we know, um, some might say um, what we know is about this kind of deep interconnection, this deep um, intimacy that blackness has with death. Mm -hmm. And basically that's the note Hortense ends on. And then what Fred knows is blackness and its kind of generative capacity and a blackness that's not predicated like Fanon by a kind of ontological negation. Mm -hmm. So I want you, and like that's, that is kind of the critical nexus, I feel, of also of like black studies at this moment, <laughs> exactly. right? Um, and even in the book about um, love is the message, Christina Sharp, like, quotes for it to say, well, no, but I think blackness is produced by horror and terror, mm -hmm. but there is this thing that then exceeds it. But I want to ask you about that, the way those two things um, are kind of inextricably linked and how that structures your work. 
because I, I mean, so I don't know if you want to say more about those, you know, a kind of, I think of it as kind of, you know, social death theory and black vitalism being yeah. in this kind of mutual relation, but it seems that in your cinematic <laughs> practice, you're also always thinking about the kind of making that happens in the whole or in the space of cramped creation. What is it that this dispossessive force produces? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny, it's like I'm not, <laughs> it's funny to say, I'm not an academic per se. Uh, and a lot of the whole, you know, the discourse around Afro-ops and Afro-pessimists was a discourse in terms of the terms I wasn't aware of when I stuck on the film, when I started on the film. But I was completely bound up in these ideas, the tension between ideas, like, it's like two things. I remember there was a moment when we were editing the film, and one of my editors turned to me and he's like, man, why do we have all this death in this film, you know? Like, can't, he's like, what's so black about this? What's so black about this? Everybody dies. Why is this? Why is this so specifically black? And uh, and I turn and I just turned to him right in the moment. And it's one of those instances where you say exactly what you think in the moment. You don't think about it afterwards. I say, look, I'm interested in at least two things. I'm interested in the experience of black people, but I'm also interested in the black experience. They're not the same things. They have a complex relationship with you, you know, with each other. They're not really quite the same things. And um, so it's something about this whole sense, and this goes to the Du Bois kind of thing of the double consciousness, or as I like to say, not trouble consciousness, I think, is more than just, you know, two looking at it in a binary kind of way. It's like a kind of, I've termed it a kind of stero stereoscopic cognition. It's like there's sort of a, a kind of cognitive depth, depth perception that happens around ideas and stuff when you were forced to look at these ideas from two multiple vantage points, right? There's something else that happens. Um, and so I think, like, even this whole question of blackness, which I think everybody is kind of, people who came of age or were coming of age in the 60s, really kind of in ways, who came of age in the 70s, really, in the right, right aftermath of the 60s, who could kind of remember it. Like, I, I literally remember James Brown being on the radio saying, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And it was the thing. Like, it was a meme. You know what I mean? Like, for real. It was like, and this is in Clarksdale, Mississippi. It was a meme. It was like going around, like, wow, say it loud. I'm like, wow, you know, I just, wow. You know, so um, I remember that really clearly. But in the 70s, things got very fuzzy. You know what I mean? In a sense, like, I think we moved from sort of a black power, we would move from civil rights to black power conception, and then we moved into what people call it black consciousness, which I think was the beginning of all of this preoccupation with the ontological nature of blackness, like what is it at the end of the day? Um, and I think, like I remember I was talking to Greg the other day, and I was saying to him, wow, you remember like, I can remember being in New York like in 80, maybe 84, 85, and it was the first time I ever like, you know, gave a public talk. I was on a, they had this conference called Show the Right Thing. Uh, you know, it was around Spike's work and Black Simmons stuff, and I was on this panel with uh, Cornell West, Bell Hooks, and David uh, Wong, and I, and I was nervous, <laughs> to say the least. I remember like, trembling, and looking over that David Wong's hand, his hands were like jittering, like I had to look away from his hands, right? Um, but I remember seeing a lot of things, many of which people just like screamed at me. I can remember literally being screamed at. Like I remember I said, we might be, we're the, I didn't, I'm saying might be, I said we are, I said I think we're the victims of integration. And people yelled from the floor. I said maybe the middle passage was an emancipatory moment. People screamed from the floor, like, that is blasphemy what you're saying now. But I think it was the beginning of starting to contend with, you know, we achieved certain legislative objectives, let's say, and we realized we weren't free. Like, you can be free on the books and still not be free. You can be free to move around and not be free in your heart, in your being, and that being free was not something that was gonna happen because we got declared free or we even <coughs> declared ourselves free that several hundred years of slavery and torture and stuff had an afterlife that wasn't going anywhere in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. 
I will never see the end of it. I don't think my kids will ever see the end of it, right? And so you, there's a kind of melancholy, I think, that's set in collectively in the black community. I mean, if it could have engaged, so to speak, I do feel like in the late 70s, going to the 80s and stuff, there was a deep-seated collective melancholy that set in as people started to realize, wow, we accomplished so much of what we said the objective was, and it didn't cure it didn't cure us, right? So it became a really complicated, and I think this tension between Afro-pessimists and Afro, you know, Afro-optimists and stuff is all, it's, it's, it's becoming a more focused articulation of these tensions. Like, you know, I love me some Fred Moten, right? But I don't agree with Fred. I never agree with Fred about the horror thing. I think black being is inextricably bound up with horror. I don't think we can get around it. I think, like, in the science fiction alternate the universe since it's just like if a supreme deity said you could snap your finger and every horrible thing that ever happened to black people, or even just a third of the horrible things that happened to black people, you could snap their finger and they wouldn't happen. None of us exist. We erase ourselves. <laughs> so that's a, like a profound dilemma on an ontological level. That's a profound dilemma. So like for me, I'm really interested in like how we get at that, you know, and part of getting at to, that to me is what I, what I was come to just term like, you know, how do we destroy linear thinking? Like how do we destroy a kind of associative thinking? Like, like the person who did it, you know, I was saying this earlier, who did it really like incredibly, like recently was Dave Chappelle, you know, like on this, he has these two new things on Netflix, right? And uh, at the end of the first one, he ends on this moment, not to spoil it or anything, but <laughs> It's not really funny. He's not even trying to be funny in this moment. He just drops the mask of trying to be funny. He just says, Bill Cosby, he did incredible works for black people. Gave money to HB, you know, H I can never say that, but historically black colleges did this. I mean, look, I remember Bill Cosby when I was five years old when he was on I Spy. He was incandescent. He was amazing. Like, you had never seen a black man. He was like, you had the white guy, and that guy was an afterthought. And Bill Cosby had been put in that show as, the after, as you know, like, oh, let's, let's be radical. We're going to put this black guy in. He was clearly smarter than the guy, sexier than the guy, sharper than the guy. He was better than Robert Culver on every level, right? And I never forgot that. That made a real impression, you know, on me when I was a kid and stuff. And then Fat Albert, right? Incredible. Fat Albert is incredible. Uh, his early show where he was a high school teacher. Incredible, right? The Cosby Show. Amazing, amazing. And he's a rapist, too. Those two things are both true. <laughs> right? And so, like, to me, the whole thing is, like, the flip side of that is we think because we have a black president that they're going to be in our interest. It's a kind of linear thinking, like the good guys have the white hats and the bad guys have the black hats. We know it's not like that in the world. So how do we disabuse ourselves of that? I'm, I'm not going to touch Cosby, but, I, but I'm going to try to. <laughs> no, it's nothing to touch. He's a rapist. He's a monster. No, no. And he did some incredibly good shit. Um, I'm still not going to touch Cosby. Okay. <laughs> but I guess um, in terms of, though, that, you know, what you're calling attention, you know, to, in a way, it's related, I would say, to your film practice. And I guess there are these, um, I don't want to call them dyads, but maybe someone might call them like uh, repeating bodies, right? Or repeating figures or linked figures in the work. And, you know, there's fall and flight, mm -hmm. is, um, as one said. There's um, terror and beauty. And then there are certain kinds of images that are also recurring. So maybe we have Gordon, the private Gordon with the scorched back. And then we um, usually also kind of like have these beautiful stills from like killer of sheep. So I don't know if you want to say what's built around those couple Things images. Are yeah, they're, they're repeating. And again, it's not as if they're, maybe they're kind of mutually constitutive, you know, the, relationship between, in love, all the kind of the falling bodies, but bodies that are... Well, I had this project that I've been working on for a while. It's called Apex. And the thing is, what I love about 
the term is self apex. It's like it's that moment when the thing is no longer rising, but it hasn't yet started to fall. It's like the thing being in that in, in that moment. Um, that moment, I think, is bound up to this thing, and I, you know, I'm terming trouble consciousness. It's like the ability to be able to see a thing three dimensionally in its full complexity. I mean, that's all I'm trying to get at when I say the cosmic thing. It's about not about you know. It's like it can be anything. So certain images to me, and I don't think this is all of those images, but I think certain images to me, they do that in a profound way. Like, I have been obsessed with the ex slave Gordon, that image, since I was 17, maybe 16 to 17 years old, pretty consciously obsessed with it. I remember sitting uh, in the tech office at UCLA when uh, Billy Woodbury used to hold court <laughs> up at UCLA in the tech office. And having that image and whipping out and saying, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the building. Said, Hold it now. Hold it, youngster. What do you mean by that? You know, and it just stopped me and I was forced. But it's something about how that image on one hand is maybe in some ways the single most object rendering. Not that you can reduce the horror part of the black experience into one image, but damn, it's, I don't know if we can do much better than that image in terms of like, a sign of objection, like on his back, those marks, right? But at the same time, the dude has this incredible, almost aristocratic dignity. And it's the tension between the two. Like, is this a scene of our, is this a sign of our objection or our majesty? And to me, it's something about black being where the misery is what, uh, you know, Wesley Brown called tragic magic. It's like the misery and the magnificence are extremely bound up. So that, to me, the ex slave Gordon image is an image of that. Now, in terms of Charles' work, in terms of Killer Sheep, I just find like that film, even just that film in particular, to be the most exquisite rendering of this quality in black social life. I don't know that anybody's made a film that really kind of gets at it with the nuance and complexity you know, of that. Like from the very first scene in the film, it's like, you know, this, the, the father is like, son, you what, you coming here with this crazy shit? Somebody else started some fight with your brother and you're standing back watching it? And you know what I mean? And like, you got to get in there and fight, right? I don't want to hear no dumb shit. You know, and basically, the young cat is just being a critical thing. He's saying like, yeah, I'm not just going to react because it's my brother. I'm just going to jump in and pile in and fight. But his father is also saying to him like, yo, that's the only person who has your back in the world. And then there's this moment when the mom is standing there with her, the other, you know, the kid, his younger brother, I guess, and you don't know, you can't tell in that moment whether the mom is like feeling bad because the, the father's lying back. And she goes over and slaps the son, bam, you know? Uh, and it's just something about that. Like, what does it mean for a loving mother to slap the shit out of you? Like, that to me seems so bound up in what blackness kind of is, you know? It's like in Love is a Message when the, the father has the son's hands on the wall. Like when I first saw that, I was, I was floored by that. I was like, I understood where it was coming from, but I was like, yo, you're going too far, man. Cause like, it's like when I was growing up, same thing, my grandmother, don't cross that street without looking at him, I'll kill you. <laughs> and everybody knows that, right? So I think it's, it's something paradoxical, I think, you know, about it. It's like when Fred says, you know, and he, I think, is reformulating Frank Wilson about the nature of the whole, the slave ship, is that it's the place where we were the most bound up, but, but inextricably, almost, uh, you know, paradoxically, it's also the place where the, the imaginative capacities were unleashed, you know? When black people came here, as slaves, when we were enslaved in the Middle Passage, like a lot of really complicated things happen, you know. Uh, like one of which, say for example, is at the same time, like I, like when I talk about the black music thing, which is you know a big central organizing trope for me around the cinema thing. And people have asked me like, why black music? Well, you could we could talk for a week just about black music alone. But one thing I would say about black music, I would say. The proof is in the pudding. It's the one place where everybody agrees, black people and not black people, that we did something pretty magnificent. So that's one level of it. But beyond that is the question always asked, but why? Why is that? Well, how, how do we account for 
the magnificence, and this is a big generalization of black music, how do we account for it? Well, one of the things I would say is this, is that, and this is my reading of it, but I feel like in the NATO, in the NATO context, in the traditional context, a lot of African music is royal music. Meaning like it's music, in the same way if you look at painting, it occupies an almost similar cultural position that painting does in the Western cultural formation and stuff. Like if you go to the Louvre and look at painting, the majority of it is religious painting. Or it's the kings and queens. It's like whatever the power structure was that could subsidize the practice of a particular thing, you know, in this interest, rendering the ruling class, right? Which would even be the church or the kings and queens, right? A lot of music in Africa is like that. It's royal music. It's like, even when you talk about griots, most of the griots are not singing about the common man. They're singing about the great heroes of Africa and stuff. And like, I always make this joke that, you know, we're not, even though we all had those ebony posters, the kings and queens of Africa, we are not the progeny of the kings and queens of Africa because we wouldn't fucking be here, by and large. Hold up, let me just, I know you're going to cut me off. Because I know I'm rambling by some offensive. So the thing about the music to me, I think one of the, the main reasons the music is so powerful is because oldest musical tradition on the face of the earth, out of Africa, right? These, we bring these musical things with us on the slave ships and very paradoxically, even though our physical being is radically constrained, the music is unleashed. It's almost like when they say AIDS happened when the AIDS virus leaked the species barrier. You know what I mean? It leaped from being in monkeys to being in human beings. And when it leaked into human beings, there was no natural predation. There was nothing that could stop it, in a sense. So I think what happened with black music is you got this incredibly rich musical tradition, sophistication, right, that's been singing this one, these songs of the ruling class. We bring these songs with us to the Americas, and there's no ruling class. We are all fixed in the lower, lower depths of class structure, right? So all of a sudden, we bring to bear this incredibly rich musical tradition on working class experiences or peasant class experiences. And not just any peasant class experiences, but peasants in the most radically dramatic circumstances, maybe one of the most radically dramatic circumstances that any group of people ever found itself in the history of mankind. That's why black music is powerful, right? Because it's that incredible structure and capacity focus on super dramatic circumstances, which is why I'm interested in cinema, because I think same thing. We can bring to bear those same types of um, uh, problematics and, and uh, possibilities or potentiality in the space of cinema. And on that note, I don't know if you want to go to the audience or if we should have one more. Oh, should I show something? Um, let me show one thing. Okay. That's all right. I mean, only because I don't want people to walk away thinking it's all doom and gloom. Uh, so maybe, can you guys hear me up there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kylie, what should, what should I show? The show? Uh, should I show the Frank Ocean or should I show the Street for Walls? Okay. It's one. It's called Crystal and Nick. Oh, hold up, let's, let's move or something, or turn the lights down. <laughs>